Good morning, let's get started. So one of the uh, most important uh, aspects of this course is uh, really the explanation of the physics of circuit elements. We have seen the resistor, the capacitor, the inductor from a more fundamental perspective. One uh, related uh, concept is what I will explain today, the current continuity equation, which is the last concept that we will cover in this course. And from that point on, we will start reviewing uh, things for the final exam. So current continuity is uh, rooted in the principle of conservation of charge. So charge conservation means that electric charge cannot be uh, generated or destroyed over all over time. It remains constant. Therefore, if I draw an arbitrary closed surface like this, so this is a closed surface S that encloses volume V, and we can, as always, uh, define the surface area element, dS, that points outwards from the surface. So this is like the surfaces that we used to apply Gauss's law. Then I divide the universe into the space inside that surface and the space outside that surface. And likewise, I have divided the charge that exists everywhere into charge inside Q in and charge outside Q out. So charge conservation means that the total charge that exists being the charge inside my surface and outside my surface remains constant over time. And to mathematically express this uh, property of the charge to remain constant and undistracted over time is to say that its time derivative is zero. So this is the mathematical expression of charge conservation which basically means that the time derivatives of the inside and the outside charge have to be exactly opposite to each other. That is, the one cannot increase unless the other decreases. So we have uh, dq in over dt plus dq out over dt equals zero. Correct? So the two rates of charge uh, change have to be exactly opposite to each other. If a charge is to be conserved everywhere, then you cannot have increase in one area unless you have an equal uh, decrease in the other area. If uh, one nanocoulomb escapes the interior of the surface, then the interior has one nanocoulomb less and the exterior has one nanocoulomb more. That is a simple concept. Now let's say that inside this surface, so I'm trying to draw exactly the same surface. Uh, let's say that inside the surface there is some volume charge density, rho sub v. Let me remind you, this is the volume charge density, which is related to the electric flux through Gauss's law. So volume charge density in Coulomb per meter cubed is inside the surface. And the only case when uh, charge changes and there is something to study uh, here about charges and uh, charge rate of change, is whenever there is a current uh, in this area. So let there be a current flow represented by this volume current density J through the surface. So volume current density in amps per meter squared. You see that the um, way that we define D sub S pointing outwards, if we 
take the flux of the current through the surface. So let me write this integral, which is current flux through the surface. So you see this is amps per meter squared. This is area in meters squared. And therefore, when you take this flux, you are calculating a current. What current is this? Because these are best points outwards, this current is positive when it goes from the inside to the outside. And therefore, that current tends to build charge in the outside area. So we take this current as positive if it actually flows outwards. Therefore, this current J dot ds is, in fact, dq out by dt. It is the positive rate of change over time of the outside charge um, dq out over dt. Do you see that? So current is dq over dt. So here we're calculating current. What current do we calculate? We calculate the current that goes out of the surface. So that is the current that builds the outside charge over time. So therefore, this equation has to hold. The current that you calculate through the surface has to be equal to dq out over dt. But uh, we can also say something about Q in, because Q in, Q inside the surface, can be expressed in terms of the volume charge density inside the surface as the integral over the volume of this volume charge density. So if you, let's say, integrate this over Cartesian coordinates, rho x, y, z, dx, dy, dz, you are finding the total, the total charge. And therefore, this dq in over dt is nothing else but the time rate of change of this integral. So I have written now two, uh, three equations, the charge conservation, that if one charge either inside or outside the surface increases, the other has to de decrease by equal amount since the total charge has to remain constant. That's what charge conservation means. The second equation is that dq out over dt can indeed build up through a current. Let that current have a current density j. Uh, I take the flux of this current through the surface, defining this sub s pointing outward. So therefore, the positive sense of this current is uh, pointing out of the surface. So therefore, this equation holds. And then I can express the charge inside the surface in terms of a volume charge density. And therefore, this dq in over dt is equal to uh, the time derivative of this volume integral. So if, if I put together equations 1, 2, and 3, I get this uh, equation that is called the current continuity equation, which reads as follows. The flux of the current through the surface S, closed surface S, so this is exactly the same situation that we have in Gauss's law, plus d over dt of this volume integral, rho v dv of the charge inside, that has to be equal to zero. So this is what we call the current continuity equation the current continuity equation that relates the flux of the current through an arbitrary closed surface with the time rate of change of the enclosed charge. Now, if you compare this to Gauss's law, that was the first law that we saw back in electrostatics, Gauss's law says that the electric flux density, the electric flux through a closed surface S, in fact, this is a closed surface. Let me just make sure that I put this in now that we have seen also 
so many open surface integrals, d dot ds is equal to enclosed charge. If you remember, that is Gauss's law. d dot ds is equal to enclosed charge, which is equal to this volume integral of volume charge density. And we showed that this can be actually transformed into a differential equation, divergence of d equals to rho sub v. And this was Gauss's law, we saw this in electrostatics, in differential form. That is in the form of a differential equation. Uh, we use that, if you remember, to extract the Poisson and the Laplace equation for the potential back in electrostatics. Now, if you compare these two laws, you see that current continuity, in current continuity, the role of D is being played by J. So look at these quantities. And then the role of rho sub v, now it is on the right-hand side. I can put this on the right-hand side as well with a minus sign so that we can compare these laws more clearly. So you see now what is the role that is being played by the volume charge density in Gauss's law is being now played by the time rate of change of the charge density. And therefore, I can also conclude that the divergence of J is minus time rate of change minus rate of change of volume charge density. So this is the current continuity in differential form. So this is the last real, really equation that I will put on the board for this class. And now let's see what this means. These are a bunch of equations that have very concrete physical meaning. So first of all, any questions up to this point? So it's been quite abstract so far. So let me just make some notes here and examples. The first example, since I wrote in the title Kirchhoff's current law, where we can apply this current continuity principle is a circuit. So consider a circuit node And I'm talking about, obviously, an electric circuit. So let's say that we have a node. And uh, let me make it a simple node with three uh, currents, I1, I2, and I3. You see the. Uh, Equation here, the current continuity equations, conti equation, applies to any surface I choose. So I choose a closed surface like this that includes the node. Okay? So I'm choosing this closed surface S to apply current continuity. Inside the surface, I have air, which is a dielectric. It is an insulator. There is no free charges. And I have these thin wires, which are so thin that they can still not support any volume charge density. If they are so thin, then 
there is no rho sub v here. And therefore, the second term in the current continuity equation is anyway zero. So in this case, no charges in air, obviously. No volume charge density, only line charges that are moving around, but no volume charge density rho sub v in the thin wires. So therefore, the uh, continuity equation reads j dot ds is equal to zero. So the total current through and out of the surface is actually zero. But here, I don't have really any difficult situation where I need to integrate over the circuit. It's just the wires that are piercing this, um, this surface. Again, the way that we define always the flux is outward flux is positive. So here, all this current, so here this current goes into the surface. So you see my DS. My DS defines the positive sense of current. I1, you see, comes into the surface. So therefore, my DS points this way. I1 points opposite. And therefore, I1 will go into this equation as minus I1. On the other hand, I2 comes out of the surface. Therefore, it comes into the equation with a positive sign. And I3 also comes out of the surface. Therefore, it goes into the equation with a positive sign. And now this is equal to zero, which, as you see, is Kirchhoff current law. And this Kirchhoff current law is really the equation of continuity. applied to a node of a circuit. So you see again, um, one more circuit law that you are familiar with that can be traced to fundamental principles in uh, electricity and magnetism, in this particular case, in electricity. Any questions up to this point? So let me do a second example on uh, the differential form of the equation. So uh, given a current density that has uh, this form R times R over A, R hat. So R is uh, the radial coordinate in the spherical coordinate system. Find the corresponding charge density. Find the corresponding charge density. So you see here, we, uh, this uh, points directly to the equation of continuity in the differential form. We're being given the form of J. So we have uh, basically a current flow that is spherical and uh, exponentially decays. So we have R that increases, but this exponentially decaying term means that this current flow will become weaker and weaker as you go outwards. So this can be the current flow that is caused, for example, by a lightning strike on an aircraft uh, where you have basically the strike at a point on the body of the aircraft and then the current distributes along the body of the aircraft. And such models are quite popular in understanding how uh, lightning uh, propagates along uh, metallic bodies like an aircraft where, the where there are two dangers. Of course, there is the danger of the structural damage at lightning, but there is also damage in electronics. Anybody can 
guess how electronics can be damaged to a lightning strike. The current does what? How does it burn it? That's the question. So it burns it because it introduces a magnetic field, which is very high. That magnetic field is intercepted by circuits on the plane. So when we say burning, we think of something that uh, causes fire. Uh, but these currents do not cause fire right away. It's not just the overdrive of a current that is an issue for an electronic system that is at the cockpit and uh, the current has uh, struck at the tail of the aircraft. So it is this current that propagates on the body, introduces strong magnetic field, which then uh, induces an electromotive force in the circuits across the plane. And this electromotive force now causes a current. And that current actually can burn out uh, different circuits on the plane. So this is the, uh, uh, the danger that is being caused. But in any case, now we are given this equation and then we want to find the charge. How much charge has been deposited on the plane um, let's say because of this uh, strike. Rho sub V, and all we need to do is go back here. Again, you see that this comes from the uh, charge conservation. And by the way, you also see here that if there is no time rate of change of volume charge, the divergence of the current is zero. What does it mean that divergence of the current is zero? That the current lines are closed. The current lines are closed. Remember, in magnetism, the divergence of the magnetic field is zero. The magnetic field lines are closed. What does this physically mean? That we cannot, have not isolated any magnetic monopole. And therefore, you don't have any source or sink of magnetic field lines. Likewise, if you are in a steady state circuit like this and theta rho sub v by theta t is zero, there is no time rate of change of volume charge density anywhere in the circuit, then the electric current lines have to be closed. And this j dot ds equal to zero means that the current lines are closed. You can also state this as divergence of J is zero. Non-zero divergence means that you have, if, if it is positive, positive divergence means that the vector whose divergence you are calculating diverges. That is, it springs out of the point where you calculate the positive divergence. Divergence that is negative means that the vector whose divergence you are calculating and you're finding negative is actually sinking at the point. So if there is no sink, no um, source, then the divergence remains zero. So now to go back here, uh, we have to express the divergence in spherical coordinates. The divergence is one over r squared, uh, d over dr of r squared times the radial coordinate, which is the only coordinate of the current density. Okay. So I'm putting the expression of the current density in there. R squared times R e to the minus R over A. So I have to take a derivative via the chain rule. So I have here, sorry, this is r. r squared times r, r cubed. Uh, so 3 r squared times e to the minus r over a plus r cubed minus 1 over a e to the minus r over a, which is the derivative of the exponent. So all in all, I have. 3 times e to the minus r over a minus r over a times e to the minus r over a.
So this is the minus rate of change of the volume charge density. So you see this expression does not depend on time. So when you find the uh, rho sub v as a function of time, it has to be a linear function of time. So and then rho v is equal to 3 minus r over a t. So it builds over time with the current plus its value at t equals 0. So if there was no volume charge density to begin with, as it would be the case, let's say, for a lightning strike, you don't have the charge before, the uh, strike comes in and then uh, builds the charge, then this second term would be 0. So this exactly correlates the current with the associated volume charge density that you have uh, in uh, the volume where the current exists. Okay, so this is this example. Uh, yes, please, sorry. Uh, yes, sorry, this was negative, yes. This is negative. Let me just put this back here so that you can see it. Negative, thank you. Okay, so this is uh, the example for the current continuity. Any questions? Other questions? Okay, so now I move on to an example on the displacement current. And I go back to the capacitor that we used to calculate the displacement current yesterday. And the question here is find the magnetic field. It is a very strange question at first. Find the magnetic field inside a parallel plate capacitor And uh, the geometry of the parallel plate capacitor is similar to what we have seen before. So we have the W being the width, L being the length, and uh, that is the upper plate, the lower plate. H, the separation. And the electric field points in the minus Z direction. Voltage here in the capacitor, I take it as time varying. And this is why I, will, I expect that I will have also a magnetic field minus VC over H. The capacitor is made out of a perfect dielectric with permittivity epsilon, epsilon not epsilon r, no conductivity. And uh, that means that my electric flux will be minus z hat epsilon not epsilon r vc over h. So now why do I expect to have a magnetic field? This is a bit strange in the sense that we introduced capacitors in electrostatics, and therefore we expect it to have only an electric field in there. However, this concept of the displacement current comes in here with this Ampere-Maxwell law. And the Ampere-Maxwell law, what it really shows is that, and let me write uh, down the law so that So it says that you can have magnetic field circulation either from conduction 
or from displacement current. So this is the conduction current due to a J, like the J that we have seen now. And this is the displacement current. Inside the capacitor, as we discussed, you cannot have uh, a conduction current if the dielectric is perfect. You could have conduction current, in fact, if I had put the conductivity, a non-zero conductivity. But now I set the conductivity to zero, so therefore I don't have any conduction current in here. If I consider the dielectric as perfect, remember what a dielectric means. It's an insulator. We talked about, in electrostatics, those two uh, extreme types of materials. The good conductor, where all charges are free to move, and the good dielectric, or a perfect dielectric, where all charges are bound to their nuclei. If they are bound, they cannot move anymore, and they cannot give you any current, or any conduction current, which is due to conduction charges moving around and giving rise to the current. So we have only the displacement current here, but if you look at these terms, you conclude right away, or you can hopefully see it, that magnetic field is produced by the displacement current in exactly the same way it is produced by the conduction current. Everything we saw in the Biot-Savart law, for example, about how currents produce magnetic fields, we can use it to understand how electric field produces magnetic field. Because you see, these terms are totally symmetric. This is conduction current, this is displacement current. So these are two terms that look exactly the same in the equation. In the Ampere law and, and the Biot-Savart law, we solve for situations like this. Only conduction current, H dot DL. So, but if you had displacement current, the law would look exactly the same. It doesn't really change. So we saw before, that a current like this produces a, a conduction current, produces a magnetic field that is circulating around it. Well, I can leverage this result, and now that I don't have a conduction current, I have a displacement current, I can say exactly the same, that what I'm expecting here is to see circulating magnetic field lines. And this is really the meat of Maxwell's equations, that electric field and magnetic field will be, yes, I know you, you, many uh, people are looking at the right hand rule. These are, uh, this is a reference, uh, a reference um, uh, direction. It can be this way or that way. Remember, the electric field also won't point always like this, because now I'm talking about an alternating voltage. So I'm just putting in reference directions, and I will apply the law, and then we will see, we, we will get to the point where we apply the right hand rule. So, um, so this is a, really the meat of Maxwell's equations, that you can have magnetic field out of electric field, and electric field out of magnetic field, and you don't need a current anymore. And that's why you can have an antenna like the antenna over there. And you can sit at your seats with your device. And you will receive a signal. Why? Because that antenna will emit, will create locally an electric field. So the antenna will have a bunch of conductors. let's say at some cycle of the current in the antenna, which is an alternating current, there will be electric field lines like this. Time varying, that means there will be circulating magnetic field like this. So if you have an electric field like this, you get a magnetic field like this. Now, if I get a magnetic field like this, Faraday's law tells me that there will be also an el another electric field further onwards. So I apply Faraday's law and I find that there will be an electromotive force on this path. Therefore, there will be another electric field here. 
and then I apply Ampere Maxwell law and I find that there will be a magnetic field now here. And now Faraday's law tells me that, there, that this flux that goes into the board and has propagated further on will introduce another electric field that goes this way. And then now the Ampere Maxwell law tells me that there will be a magnetic field that goes this way. And this will repeat all the way until it reaches your device. And when you are holding here your little device, there will be an electric field that comes in and will be inducing the signal. And that signal is the signal that uh, will bring the information signal to your device. And that is how we receive from radio stations, from access points and so on and so forth, precisely because there is this interplay of these laws. And at the end of the day, the same way that a current wire generates a magnetic field, so does a time-varying electric field. And therefore, you don't need a, a wire connection with this access point to receive a signal. A time-varying electric field can actually do it. And it does it in this sequence of events. So this being said, how much is now the magnetic field that we have inside? We have a situation where we uh, can apply Ampere Maxwell law. inside the capacitor so I go inside the capacitor and uh, and I apply the law the application itself will be very simple, very similar to what we have seen in Ampere's law. So I draw a circle which I will trace this way. So this is my C, my DS points upwards. So my DS is uh, pointing in the plus Z direction. And now I have, and, and also I conclude from this argument that since now it is the displacement current in the Z direction, so Z directed displacement current creates a magnetic field that is in the phi direction. We saw this in Ampere's law. So just like conduction current in the z direction, if you remember uh, conduction current, I gave you in Ampere's law a general rule that if I had any current of this form, the magnetic field, I can immediately assume that it has this form. So now with this correspondence between the Ampere law and the Ampere Maxwell law, the current, conduction current, displacement current, I can directly guess that my magnetic field will be circulating around this displacement current. And therefore, the left-hand side of the equation, H dot DL, will be H phi times 2 pi r. Just like in the examples that we did for the Ampere Maxwell law, for, sorry, for the Ampere law, uh, in uh, current distributions on a, a thin wire or on a thick wire on a coaxial cable. We have a bunch of such examples. The right hand side now d dot ds is as follows. I have my electric flux density, which is minus or epsilon on epsilon r v sub c over h with minus z hat. So 
you shouldn't worry about the signs. I, we will apply, uh, you see, we applied the right-hand rule to find ds. So now I can put in the electric field, the electric flux density, and then my ds is in the z direction in the loop. Minus z dot plus z is minus 1. The rest are constants, so therefore I find epsilon naught epsilon r vc over h times the area of this circle, the area of this disk, which is pi r squared, considering this disk uh, to have radius r. So I use that radius here as well. So, and in fact, this law just to add it in, this line integral is along this same circle of radius r moving along the phi direction. So this is z. Okay. So, however, what I need here is not this flux, but the time rate of change, which only affects v sub c. So d by dt of this flux is the displacement current. And you see the only thing that changes with respect to time is the voltage. And uh, therefore, I will have epsilon naught epsilon r divided by h pi r squared dvc over dt. And putting everything together, I have that magnetic field times 2 pi r is equal to pi r squared dvc by dt. So the magnetic field is actually increasing with radius, as you see, linearly inside the capacitor. So not only you have a magnetic field, but in fact it linearly increases inside the capacitor. Okay. So this is a little connection between the electric and the magnetic fields, even in the most electric element that you can think of, which is the capacitor, if you have time-varying magnetic field. Why do we not care about this magnetic field in capacitors? It has never bothered you in your electronics, electric circuit labs. Just too small, right? Too small in uh, if this dv over dt is not very large. So for the signals that you are using in your electronics labs and the size of the capacitors that you are dealing with, if you calculate the displacement current over uh, a centimeter squared capacitor or a millimeter squared capacitor, for a kilohertz signal or a 10 kilohertz signal or a 100 kilohertz signal, then the displacement current is negligible. And that's why this doesn't play any role. However, if you, if you had this parallel plate system in a printed circuit board that you wanted to operate for a processor of a CPU and now the signal was in the gigahertz, then you would need to take this effect into account. And that's why EC 320 starts from uh, taking the system of two parallel plates and telling you that it is called a transmission line that supports electromagnetic waves because once you take those parallel plate systems and you drive them at gigahertz and uh, one, two, three, Wi-Fi is a 2.4, so these components are all over the place, the computers now, the CPUs, uh, three gigahertz and up, then you actually have this effect pr effects present and critical for the operation of these components. So I can fit in uh, an example on Faraday's law in the last uh, minute. Yes, I can probably do this. Uh, this is the Faraday wheel. Uh, it is uh, a structure like this that I will try to solve. 
a disk that has been attached to an axis So I have here a metallic disk. Radius A. That has been attached to an axis and it is rotating with uh, angular frequency omega. And I connect it to a circuit through brush contacts. So brush contact means that it allows the wheel to spin. So this simply makes the contact between uh, the wire here and the spinning wheel. Okay, but it doesn't uh, block it from spinning. So the wheel is spinning through this brush contact. I have one more here. And at this point, I close the circuit and I put even a light bulb And it is almost, and, and the whole thing is inside the magnetic field, constant magnetic field that comes out like this. And it is in the z direction. So b is equal to b naught z hat. So you see it is a very strange device. It's called the Faraday wheel. And it's spinning inside the constant magnetic field and you can actually produce a current from this. And I have here a proof. So in this case, I will spin the wheel. And I'm producing a current. Okay. So it is almost a mystery where this current comes from. But this is a mystery that uh, Faraday's law can actually resolve. And that's why this is called also the Faraday wheel. And the easiest way to resolve this mystery is actually by applying Faraday's law along this path. Let me call it one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is the path where I will apply Faraday's law. And let me trace this path uh, in this sense. Right, so I will apply Faraday's law in this uh, path uh, 1 to 6 to 5, 4, 3, 2, and back 1. Eta DL is the EMF that I'm seeking, which will act as a virtual source. I repeat that if it were positive, it would drive current in the direction that I'm tracing the loop. So you see this uh, path intercepts magnetic flux only through this area. The rest of the circuit is parallel to the magnetic flux. The magnetic flux is passing along the z-axis. So the circuit intercepts only on the wheel flux right here in this sector. What is the flux that we intercept? I call this angle theta. Okay. And with this angle theta, I can express the flux as, you see here, as I trace the loop, the positive sense of flux is actually upward. So therefore, this magnetic field introduces positive flux. So you can see it right here. So the sense of uh, positive flux is upward. The uh, magnetic flux density is constant. It's equal to B naught. And then the area of this sector can be found as follows. The whole disk has area pi A squared. But here I have only angle theta instead of 2 pi. So when I have 
the area, the angle here on this sector being theta, as opposed to 2 pi, that is the whole disk, I, uh, I enclose area, that is the area of the disk times the ratio of the angles, theta over 2 pi. So pi is cancel out, and I have B naught A squared theta over 2. Okay? So then the EMF is minus time rate of change of uh, B naught a squared theta over 2. The only thing that changes here over time is neither the magnetic field flux nor the radius of the disk, obviously, but the angle, only the angle. So we have B naught A squared over 2, D theta over DT. So this is the angular um, frequency. So it is B naught A squared omega over 2. So this is the EMF that I am observing over there. And uh, for the light bulb, uh, you can find the, the uh, relation of the voltage at the light bulb with the EMF. Now, once you have the EMF, you can apply Kirchhoff's voltage law. And you have minus V EMF plus V is equal to 0. And that means that the voltage is minus B naught A squared omega over 2. So that's how the Faraday wheel works. And uh, the current finally flows opposite to the direction that we have assumed. That is consistent with Lenz's law. Because you see the current flows opposite. As the wheel spins, it intercepts more and more flux. So therefore, the induced current is actually going in the other direction and creates a magnetic field that points downwards. So resists the external magnetic flux. So this is the first of many examples we will do from now onwards. Thanks for your attention, and we'll see you next week with more examples and more review questions.